So thanks for staying so long today and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. So what I'm going to discuss is uh, the issue of, uh, is the question of, uh, first of all, what is uh, cosmology from the point of view of uh, quantum gravity? And uh, second, uh, what happens to the cosmological singularity? What could happen to the cosmological singularity within quantum gravity? And uh, in particular, I'm going to take a perspective on quantum gravity in which uh, space-time is a sort of uh, quantum many-body system. And I will make more precise uh, what I mean by that in the context in which I will uh, describe it like this and uh, in which uh, continuum space-time and geometry are emergent notions from the collective quantum properties of whatever are the fundamental degrees of freedom. I think that this perspective uh, uh, fits uh, with the number of uh, quantum gravity formalism. I'm going to use one uh, group field theory for two, actually three main reasons. One is that uh, this uh, picture of uh, space-time as a quantum many-body system is very uh, literal. Uh, you have a Hilbert space of states, which is uh, the, the typical one for uh, quantum many-body systems. The second reason is that uh, thanks to this, uh, you can apply a number of uh, quantum field theoretic tools and approximations of a rather standard type, despite the exotic uh, context, uh, to understand the emergence of uh, continuum space-time and geometry and of general relativity. And this emergence of general relativity and uh, continuum space-time and geometry is the key uh, open issue in, uh, in a number of, uh, uh, well, in all quantum gravity approaches I know of. And the third reason is that uh, this formalism, although uh, it is, of course, one specific formalism, it uh, incorporates insights and results from a number of related approaches. And so I think that uh, it's going to be useful for related formalism as well, and vice versa. Uh, results obtained in related approaches uh, are useful here. So this is a good point. And uh, okay, so the plan is going to give a very short introduction to the formalism, introducing only the few key aspects that allow me to ask the question about cosmology and then of the cosmological singularity. Then I will describe this uh, specific way of uh, uh, studying cosmology, of trying to embed cosmology within quantum gravity, called uh, group field theory condensate cosmology, giving you the main idea and some uh, uh, recent results. And having done that, uh, I will discuss uh, what this uh, uh, line of research suggests about possible fates of the cosmological singularity. OK, let's start. So uh, the description of uh, space, uh, quantum space as a, a quantum many-body system starts with a, uh, an assumption about what is the single body, the quantum of the uh, 3D space. And you can think of it as, a, a, in this formalism, as a quantized tetrahedron. So a tetrahedron is just uh, this uh, piece of uh, flat space, uh, which uh, uh, a finite number of degrees of freedom, you can describe its geometry in the, in the classical, in classical simplicial geometry, by just giving uh, four vectors, each valued initially, in, each valued initially in R31, but then you impose a condition that the four vectors have to lie on a given hypersurface, which is the hypersurface where you think of the, of the tetrahedron uh, as uh, you think as the ambient space of the uh, tetrahedron, and they have to close. As a result, they are actually vectors in R3, which close, which also means they can be understood as uh, elements of the algebra of SU2, which is isomorphic as a vector space to R3. There is an equivalent description of a more covariant type in, in terms of uh, uh, the algebra elements of SO31, which you can show uh, to be equivalent to this one after you impose suitable constraints. And this is the sort of the equivalence. That means that you, you can describe uh, the phase space, the classical phase space of a single tetrahedron in purely algebraic terms, 
the basic variables being uh, group elements and uh, conjugate Lie algebra elements. So the Lie algebra elements are this uh, uh, area two forms, or in this description, this uh, um, uh, phase uh, normal vectors. Um, okay. And the conjugate variables are instead group elements. In fact, you can think of a tetrahedron just as a, a node with four outgoing links, and to each link you associate a group element, which you can think of as uh, the parallel transport of a connection from here to here, of a SU2 or SO3-1 connection from the node to the outmost uh, point. And uh, that is a discrete uh, definition of a connection. So the phase space is this, and the actual configuration satisfying constraints within this larger or this phase space. So in general, you're going to try to describe uh, the, your atoms of space in terms of the phase space, which is the cotangent bundle of a group, of a group manifold, of a group. You can quantize this uh, uh, system by number of methods. The end result is that uh, is a Hilbert space for a single tetrahedron that you can uh, represent as an L2 space with the R measure over the group, over several copies of the group, plus constraints that you want to impose on the states to ensure geometricity of your uh, discrete structures. Okay. I'm not giving you, the, of course, the history and why this, uh, I mean, this is a number of results uh, in the literature, in a simplicial uh, quantum geometry, in a loop quantum gravity, spin form models, uh, and uh, a lot of people have been involved in the last uh, 20 years, basically. And this is just one piece of a large literature. So, so this is uh, the fundamental atom of space, a tetrahedron, or dually, you can think of it as a spin network vertex. Then, from starting from the single atom phase, um, Hilbert space, you can just define a Fox space, assuming bosonian statistics, in which uh, you build uh, generic quantum structures out of a Fox vacuum, in which there's neither topological nor geometric structure. And you're going to have uh, second quantized operators, ladder operators, uh, moving you around this uh, uh, Fox space in the different uh, uh, n-particle sectors, or d-particle sectors in this notation. And generic operators are going to be, in this second quantized language, are going to be uh, functionals of the fundamental ladder operators. There are also the second quantized versions of uh, first quantile geometric operators associated to a quantum tetrahedron alone, or a number of quantum tetrahedra. The simplest ones, of course, are those which are just, which are just additive in the number of tetrahedra, and among them, the simplest is the volume operator. So you have a notion of a volume of a single tetrahedron coming from simplicial geometry that you can quantize. And uh, the total volume of associated to your state is just the sum of the contributions. So it's basically the number operator convoluted with the contribution to the total volume coming from each tetrahedron. Okay. So quantum space uh, in this uh, description is like a system of uh, many quantum tetrahedra. You can generalize to polyhedra or many quantum spin network vertices. Obviously, if this is the only thing I say, and uh, then generic states are not going to be very spacey. They will not look uh, like any continuum space, obviously, but not even any nice uh, simplicial geometry. Uh, simplest example of a non-spacey uh, um, quantum state is the one in which you just don't connect, don't glue, and leave independent all these tetraedra. So connected many-body states within this Fox space are a little bit more spacey. I'm going to say only one thing about this uh, connected states, which is that uh, um, you can indeed identify a, a sub Hilbert space associated to a specific graph, which is a specific way of gluing these uh, spin network vertices. 
And the other thing I'm going to say is simply that this gluing of tetrahedra or of spin network vertices along common links is basically establishing the entanglement between uh, uh, these individual atoms. Okay, and again, there are a number of uh, results here. I think starting with um, the first one I know is probably from uh, Etera and uh, Danny, long time ago. Uh, so within the same Hilbert space, there are in particular connected uh, tetrahedral or spin network states associated to graphs or to extended simplicial configurations. Okay. The dynamics in this second quantized language, language is what governs uh, the uh, gluing processes and the formation of extended discrete structures. So the interaction processes will correspond, uh, the possible interaction processes will correspond to uh, simplicial or polyhedral complexes one dimension higher. So the, a history of possible evolution of a bunch of tetrahedra that can be glued, disconnected, and so on, is going to be some possibly very pathological, simplicial four-dimensional complex. Okay? And this uh, gluing processes, the dynamics, is uh, encoded in any specific model in the choice of an action. The, if the interaction has to do with gluing tetrahedra along uh, the boundaries, the pieces of the boundaries, the faces, the result is that the interactions have to be combinatorially non-local in the field arguments. I give an example, I hope to clarify what I mean by combinatorially non-local. Each field entering the interaction represents uh, at the quantum level is going to be just one quantum interacting with the other quanta of the fundamental discrete interaction processes. So take five of them, each has four arguments, each of which associated to a phase of the tetrahedron, so a triangle. The gluing is a gluing along common triangles between uh, uh, two tetrahedra. So take a pairwise gluing of five of them, and this is the combinatorics of a four simplex. In this sense, is the basic building block of a four-dimensional triangulation, a four-dimensional simplicial um, complex. And the uh, gluing at the interaction level is this propagation. So just identification of uh, boundary tetrahedra between two four simplices. You can generalize to other type of combinatorial structures, and your choice of combinatorial structure of the interaction processes is a choice of um, pairing of arguments among the fields entering the interaction. Okay. The result of this very general definition is that uh, when you write down the quantum theory and you expand it uh, perturbatively in uh, the interactions, so you write down the Feynman expansion in diagrams, in Feynman diagrams, each uh, describing a possible interaction process of this tetrahedra, the partition function, uh, you're attempting a definition of the partition function in terms of a sum over Feynman diagrams, which is a sum over possible triangulations, weighted by an amplitude associated to each diagram which is a triangulation. So it's like uh, you have an amplitude that weights each possible triangulation. And it's, it contains a sum over the possible discrete geometries of that triangulation. I'm going to say something more in a second. So the Feynman diagrams are going to be, by construction, all possible gluings, so cellular complexes of arbitrary topology. The problem is not to write it down, the problem is to control it and to make mathematical sense of it, which is something I'm going to touch in, in a couple of slides. So this is, I, I took a route uh, which is just, I define you the basic structures, I gave you a formalism. The first question you're probably asking yourself first, and you, you'll be asking me in a while, if I didn't try to answer it before, is uh, what does this have to do with gravity? And I will first give you an answer, which is uh, what is, I will try to explain what this has to do with discrete gravity. The 
answer to what this has to do with continuum gravity is exactly the problem of extracting general relativity, continuum physics, and in particular cosmology out of the formalist, which will be uh, the, the main point of the talk and in the second part. So what does this have to do with uh, uh, discrete gravity? Well, first of all, I already hinted at a relation between this formalism and uh, loop quantum gravity in the sense that the type of quantum degrees of freedom that we have in this formalism are the same as in loop quantum gravity, that is spin networks, but they are organized in a different Hilbert space. So it's the same, the same type of states, but the way you define the scalar product and you organize the, these degrees of freedoms results in a different uh, uh, Hilbert space. You can think of it as a second quantized reformulation of, uh, of the theory, but you have to uh, accept some uh, uh, modifications of the uh, usual structures. First point. So it has to do with gravity, at least in the sense that uh, it shares the same type of degrees of freedom as an approach uh, which starts as a, just a canonical quantization of the continuum gravity. So it, it has at least that form of anchoring in a gravitational theory. The second form of anchoring is that uh, um, you can show that uh, for any choice of uh, what is it? any choice of action, group field theory action of the type I uh, introduced uh, in the previous slide, there is a corresponding Feynman amplitude, of course, and uh, generically these Feynman amplitudes can be recast or understood as so-called spin form models, which is uh, um, a covariant version of formulating the dynamics of spin networks in loop quantum gravity. So this is another way in which uh, you can uh, um, relate this more uh, well, different formalism within uh, another quantum gravity uh, context about which we know uh, a lot. Third, remember I told you that the Feynman expansion of uh, the par uh, partition function of any group field theory model involves a sum over Feynman diagrams in the perturbative definition, a sum over Feynman diagrams which are triangulations weighted by an amplitude. Well, another way to rewrite uh, equivalently the same amplitudes that can give rise to spin form models is as uh, simplicial gravity path integrals in terms of first order discretizations, so discretizations of first order gravitational actions. So you, to say differently, you can start from continuum GR written in connection and tetrad variables, or in 3D connection and triad variables, discretize on a lattice, and you obtain a, a discrete path integral with some choice of measure. That choice of measure plus action can be also obtained as the Feynman amplitude of a specific group field theory model. Okay? So the definition of the quantum theory here combines uh, the basic idea of uh, quantum regge calculus, so discrete IGR, and then sum over all the edge lengths to define uh, a quantum path integral for the theory, for which you have then to take a continuum limit, and the idea of dynamical triangulations in which uh, uh, with some amplitude, just sum over all possible triangulations for a given topology, again, to define the gravitational path integral. And again, the problem becomes to study the continuum limit. Okay, so this is another way in which it relates to discrete uh, uh, quantum gravity. So the details of the discrete geometric content, the weights, the uh, dynamics, and so on, of course, depend on the specific uh, group field theory models uh, you, you, you study, you're interested in. The general point I want to make here is that uh, the relation to gravity uh, is uh, clear and solid with all technical issues here and there that I'm happy to discuss at the discrete level. What is left, uh, just like in other quantum gravity approaches, as I mentioned, is the issue of the continuum limit. Here comes one advantage that the formalism, the group field theory formalism gives, uh, as compared to other approaches, which is that uh, the problem of defining the continuum limit for such a field theory, even though it encodes uh, a discrete path integral, a dynamical triangulations model, and so on, is the problem of defining the full partition function of a certain field theory. 
And notice that despite the fact that it's a background independent uh, uh, formulation of gravity in the sense that it doesn't rely on any given space-time structure, from the formal point of view of uh, the quantum field theory, it's an almost standard field theory on a given domain, which is the Lie group manifold, which has a topology, a metric, a killing form, and a, a bunch of other uh, structures that you can take advantage of. The problem of defining the um, full partition function, that is the full continuum limit, is the problem of the non-perturbative renormalization of uh, any given model. And this has been tackled, uh, so to you want to establish the full RG flow, including the continuum phase diagram. That is what you're supposed to be doing to, to say that uh, you have under control the continuum limit of any given group field theory model. And this has been done recently mostly, mostly through functional randomization group uh, uh, techniques. The general strategy in all this work that I'm going to just briefly summarize in, in the next slide is, as I said, to treat uh, group field theories as ordinary quantum field theories on a given uh, manifold, which is the Lie group. You can define scales, I'm sure I will fall at some point. Uh, you can define scales uh, by the spectrum of the propagator, like the Laplacian. If there is any differential operator here, you can use the spectrum of that to define notion of scale. Even more intuitively, well, you have a, a Lie group manifold. There is a notion of uh, uh, small and large on the group manifold. And uh, the more you are able to resolve uh, the continuum structure of the group manifold, so you go close to, the, to a point, the more you are UV in the formal sense of, uh, of the quantum field theory. Just like with the, the old study of renormalization and later uh, the extraction of uh, uh, continuum physics, the problem is not so much to set up uh, the calculations uh, and to do them. I mean, that's a technical issue. The issue is then to translate uh, in possible uh, gravitational, spatial, temporal uh, terms the, the various results you obtain. But the point I want to make here is simply that uh, the general strategy, at least at the formal level, is really straightforward. Except the main difficulty, as I, as I said, the main difference between group field theories and ordinary quantum field theories is the fact that these interactions are highly non-local from the combinatorial point of view, the way you relate the different arguments of the fields entering there. The Feynman diagram, in other words, the Feynman diagrams are triangulations, cellular complexes. They have a highly complicated combinatorial topological structure. Isn't, they are not just graphs. Okay? As a result, controlling the Feynman expansion or the possible interactions, the coarse graining and so on, is much more complicated. But at least you can set up the formalism roughly in a standard way, provided you're able to redefine several quantum field theory notions. The, the notion of connectedness, uh, the contraction of subgraphs, weak ordering, you have to do a lot of work in uh, adapting. For example, this would be just a radiative correction in a 3D model as a propagator, but you can glue, uh, there are two tetrahedra and one here, and you glue to another one here, and you see that it's not just a loop, it, it has a more complicated internal structures a, a, having to do with the uh, combinatorics of two tetrahedra glued together. And this is in a different class of models. Uh, again, you, you should think of each uh, uh, dashed line as a propagator line, but then the vertices have a complicated structure that you have to take into account. And there are different graphical ways of doing it. So this is not to really explain, but just to give you a hint that there is a complicated combinatorial structure involved in the diagrams that you have to take into account when you renormalize. Anyway, we want to study the non-perturbative renormalization. You also want to make sure that at the perturbative level, given that you first have a definition in terms of Feynman expansion, you want to make sure that these models are well-defined perturbatively, because again, at the perturbative level, you don't expect to find continuum physics, but it's where you have some control about, uh, some direct control over the relation to loop quantum gravity, discrete path integrals, and so on, which helps with the model building. And here, the only thing I can say is that there are studies of divergences in a large class of uh, interesting models. Uh, there, is a, there are proofs of renormalizability of a number of other models uh, 
of different types and on a billion, a billion in different dimensions uh, and so on. We are building uh, experience and confidence in studying the renormalization of these models. At the non-perturbative level, again, to make a very long uh, uh, story short, uh, we seem to find that rather generically for the models which are well-defined perturbatively, we seem also to find uh, generically asymptotic freedom or asymptotic safety. So they seem to be well-defined also in this uh, uh, non-perturbative sense. And we start finding hints of a non-trivial phase diagram. Uh, in particular, uh, we have hints of a Wilson-Fisher fixed point in the infrared, which is rather peculiar given that we have uh, you know, asymptotic freedom in this, often in the same models uh, in the UV. Anyway, so these field theories are interesting even if you're not interested in quantum gravity, just as peculiar quantum field theories which, which are a new arena to uh, explore, a new landscape of theories to explore. What is interesting from the, for the rest of the talk uh, is that uh, we also have hints of a con condensate phase or co condensed phase and you can ask whether this could be a, a candidate for a geometric spatiotemporal phase by which I just mean a phase where in some approximation you can get GR and uh, usual metric and geometry. And by condensate, it just means uh, that uh, at least the mean field, uh, the mean field description, at the mean field level, you find that the uh, minimum of the classical potential is, is non-trivial. So you have a non-zero expectation value for the field operator. Okay, as a simple definition of a, of a condensate. So this is what I'm going to take as a suggestion at this stage, not as a proof of anything, unfortunately, to look for continuum physics. I'm going to explore possible continuum um, uh, condensate states. Okay, now we ask uh, 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 finally the question, if this is the form for uh, quantum gravity, these are the microscopic degrees of freedom, how do I extract uh, uh, continuum physics? What do I try to do? Well, I have to control quantum states that encode a large number of this microscopic stuff. It doesn't mean that they cannot use approximations in which only few microscopic degrees of freedom are involved, fine, but I want to be able to control also large superpositions of uh, complexes and uh, quantum states. And I should be able to do some form of coarse graining of the description. I want to be able to, to find states or approximations in which a large number of the microscopic degrees of freedom are encoded in a very few collective observables and um, variables. And this will require approximations. And again, the nice thing is that we can take advantage of a quantum field theory formalism and methods. So we take seriously this suggestion of the universe as a sort of a quantum many-body system, and we go forward. So we ask in particular about cosmology. It is supposed to be the simplest form of uh, continuum physics uh, I can think of, in the sense that it involves uh, uh, the simplest type of continuum geometries, which are non-trivial, so the homogeneous ones. So there are two ways in which you can try to study uh, cosmology and homogeneous geometries within quantum gravity. I mean, quantum cosmology has been discussed already in a few previous talks, and that's one way. You think of cosmology as uh, a sector of general relativity, the one related to uh, uh, homogeneous geometries, and then you quantize them. And uh, you already have, uh, you had already uh, some uh, uh, suggestions for reading, because there are a number of uh, interesting results there. And in particular, in the context of loop quantum cosmology, which is the closest to uh, the one I'm uh, discussing here, one result being uh, the possibility of a bouncing scenario replacing uh, uh, the Big Bang singularity. And my problem here would be to take a different perspective on cosmology within the full theory and try to see if this type of scenarios can be embedded in it. The second perspective is the one in which you see homogeneous cosmologies and generically continuum geometries as the result of coarse graining, as I said. The result of uh, you know, looking at, uh, only at a few observables in a theory that has many more, but you only work with the full quantum theory and you try to extract an effective description. So this is in a way is in line also with the, uh, with the talk of Martin this morning, and maybe I can I will highlight and other point, points of contact later 
And if not, please uh, remind me. Um, I, I would argue that uh, this more effective description of what cosmology is within quantum gravity is a necessity if the fundamental quantum theory is not based on structures which are directly the quantization of continuum geometries. So you have a different type of degrees of freedom. <clears throat> okay, now I, I make two very heuristic slides. To, again, to direct us uh, to uh, what we should be looking for within the full theory. And then I will show you how you um, realize this idea in a, in a concrete case. So you can think, you would, uh, in, at least I would intuitively think of cosmology within the full theory as the case in which you have very few macroscopic observables of a type of global nature, which are the relevant ones, at least in first approximation. You are close to equilibrium, which means close to some um, maximal entropy state in the full theory or close to some full solution of the dynamics and so on. And you don't have too many fluctuations. I mean. And uh, you are reasonably insensitive to the microstructure. Otherwise, we would have noticed uh, uh, before that there was some microstructure. And this is basically the definition of an hydrodynamic regime. So the suggestion, uh, at least as a working hypothesis, would be to look at uh, the sector of the full quantum gravity formalism that would correspond to its hydrodynamic regime or approximation or sector. And how should it look like? Again, this is just heuristic uh, um, uh, discussion. Well, you would expect that the key variable is going to be some sort of uh, reduced one-body density, like in normal hydrodynamics, uh, co corresponding with having as domain of uh, um, its domain, so it's a function on the space associated with a single atom of space. This is what I mean by a reduced one-body density. And Given that it has to work like a probability density for cosmological observable, you would expect that it's like, it has to look like a density on mini superspace. So again, the heuristics suggest that uh, uh, you're going to look for and try to extract from the full formalism as a basic variable, a single body, one body density function of the geometric data of mini superspace. And that cosmology within the full theory would look like a nonlinear dynamics for such density and for the uh, corresponding observables that you compute out of it. Okay, again, this is the heuristic. Now I show you one realization. So the idea is to see quantum hydrodynamics as a sort of nonlinear extension of quantum cosmology. And this type of idea, again, has been suggested uh, by other people before, like uh, Martin and collaborators. Um, OK. Take this, plus the suggestion that there is a condensate phase. And then, given that the theory is complicated enough, you start with the simplest approximation for the hydrodynamics of a condensate in a quantum many-body system. You assume your, uh, your system organizes itself in a quantum fluid uh, phase, a condensate, a quantum condensate, we say, okay, what is the simplest approximation? The simplest approximation to that is a, a coherent state of the field operator, which is just the Gross-Pitesky type approximation for the, the uh, uh, dynamics of uh, both condensates. And of course, this is not a realistic state. In, indeed, it corresponds to an arbitrary infinite superposition of states formed by a disconnected tetrahedra, like a gas of many, many tetrahedra, and you forget about any possible correlation, except that they are all weighted by the same wave function. There is a condensate, so you're assuming that they all fell into the same quantum state. The point is that this, the collective wave function that captures this inf infinite superposition, is this sigma, has the same domain as uh, the group field theory field, model uh, some extra conditions that you have to impose. And this domain is indeed isomorphic to mini superspace. Another way to put it is that uh, you could, we could have noticed before that the space of geometries of a single tetrahedron up to embedding in R4 or R31 is uh, the same as the uh, space of geometries at a point 
which is itself the same as the space of uh, homogeneous geometries. Um, okay, so we have a, a quantum state in the full theory, weighted by a single, captured, I mean, uh, described by a single collective wave function, which is a function on mini superspace. Indeed, is the reduced one body density in, uh, in the theory of Bose condensates. Um, okay, you have a corresponding effective dynamics, which for this very simple state is nothing else, well, with some minor ap extra approximation, that the classical equation of motion or whatever fundamental group field theory model you start from. And it's a nonlinear equation for uh, this collective wave function. So it has a linear part and some nonlinear functional of the wave function. It is literally the mean field hydrodynamics of the system, or gross pitesque hydrodynamics. And uh, you can think of it indeed as a nonlinear extension of quantum cosmology for with the quantum cosmology wave function being replaced by this collective wave function for the condensate. Okay. So this is very general. Now uh, I give you a, 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 the results of co some concrete calculations in a given model. And before I just want to put a word of caution, I use the, wor the words uh, nonlinear quantum cosmology we should, we should raise immediately some alert uh, uh, signs because, uh, well, if the wave function satisfies a nonlinear equation, well, you don't have a quantum cosmology. There's no Hilbert space structure. You cannot have linear superpositions of solutions. So the moment you extend the linear dynamics with a nonlinear part, which you have to because you have, you're doing hydrodynamics, not really quantizing uh, simplicial uh, mini superspace uh, geometries. Well, you are actually out of any quantum cosmology type interpretation, which is bad because there is a lot known about how to deal with quantum cosmology wave functions, but it's sort of good because, frankly, I never understood how to interpret the quantum cosmology wave function. So, um, okay, so there is a sort of really statistical nature of this collective wave function. Even though you have a, a Hilbert space of a, and a full, uh, almost standard quantum theory, which is, however, the one for the underlying degrees of freedom. Okay, now I give you a concrete example and some results. There. Do I have uh, 10 minutes? 5 minutes? 10 minutes. I'm so proud of myself. Um, okay, take uh, a model that everybody loves from the loop quantum gravity, simplicial quantum gravity, spin foam uh, corner, so-called uh, EPRL model for 4D Lorentzian quantum gravity, written in terms of SU2 data, and you couple it to a discretized scalar field. What I mean by that is, is just like uh, the um, group field theory model for the gravitational sector, so-called, is interpreted as such because the corresponding Feynman amplitudes look like uh, discrete gravity path integrals. You add the degrees of freedom in such a way, you just add the real variable to the field in such a way with the specific couplings, in such a way that the corresponding Feynman amplitudes are simplicial gravity path integral for gravity coupled to a real massless uh, uh, free scalar field. Okay, so at the discrete level, you give this interpretation. You write down the same type of uh, condensate states. Then you uh, reduce uh, to, the, to much simpler condensate states that only capture isotropic type of data in the mini superspace interpretation of the domain I, I um, discussed uh, a couple of slides ago. In practice, the condensate wave function only depends uh, on one single spin, a representation, an irreducible unitary representation of SU2, and a real variable. Okay. So it's really a simple type of uh, state. You write down the corresponding uh, gross pitesque uh, hydrodynamics, and it is some uh, uh, quartic uh, uh, equation for sigma, for this reduced uh, sigma here with some uh, uh, coefficients which are dependent on J and depend, uh, they just come from the microscopic model. At this stage, you don't need to know anything more about them. Plus, you are pro because you are in this uh, gross pitesque type of, of, of approximation, this is consistent 
with uh, considering these uh, uh, interactions as, as subdominant. So they are there, but they are subdominant compared to the kinetic part, to the linear part. Not only this is consistent with the, um, with the type of states we're using as a first approximation, but it's also a sort of regime in which we have a little bit of more uh, geometric understanding of the model, because as I said, it's in the perturbative regime that we obtain spin form models and discrete gravity path integrals. So this regime is interesting from that point of view, small interactions. Okay, so you take that, uh, um, so that is the hydrodynamic equation for the collective wave function. You want to recast it in the form of some uh, equation for geometric observables, which have to be geometric observables for this infinity of microscopic degrees of freedom, even though you are in a simple state and you look at very simple observables. You can construct uh, relational observables as uh, expectation values of operators in the full theory, in the full formulas, expectation values taken in this simple condensate state. For example, you can consider the universe volume at fixed time, meaning a fixed value of the scalar field that you're using as a relational clock, as you would do normally in, in quantum cosmology. And you get a certain function. Again, these are computed in, in the full theory, they're not uh, coming from somewhere else. And uh, of course, all this list of approximations. Then you can write down the momentum of the scalar field, again at fixed uh, clock time, and the energy density of the scalar field in terms of uh, ratio of expectation values. Okay, then you have an equation of motion for sigma. From that, uh, you obtain an equation of motion relating these observables. And you have to hope, you have to hope that it closed, that the equation is closed. <laughs> In the regime in which the interactions are subdominant, the equations are complicated, but not too bad. The prime has to, is the derivative with respect to the scalar field, with respect to the relational clock. So you have some complicated equations, two equations, uh, relating the first and the second derivatives. There are two conserved quantities, E and Q, and, and this is the uh, modulus of the condensate wave function, the, actually the density of the fluid. Now there are two nice things about that you can show about these two equations. One is uh, you, are, you are not already wrong, which is that uh, in a classical regime, which is more or less small densities, large volumes, and so on, uh, you obtain uh, the uh, approximately the uh, classical Friedman equations. There is a, a sufficient conditions, so if this is true, m is a ratio of the a and b parameter I've shown in the uh, hydrodynamic equation. Uh, that's already a sufficient condition for getting the right Friedman equation in relational variables uh, in this regime, but it's not necessary. You can have a more general reduction to that. And the second nice uh, result is that you can show that the volume, as defined earlier, if it is subject to these equations, remain positives at all times with a single turning point in relational clock, which means you have a, a, a bounce. So you don't have the classical singularity, but you have a bounce. Now, I've, I've listed all the various approximations, of course, that uh, lead to this type of result. And another nice result, if you come from loop quantum cosmology in particular, is that uh, if you take an even simpler condensate wave function, which instead of uh, weighting um, uh, non-trivially all possible spin values, only has non-zero value for one spin, so you have a condensate in which all the tetrahedra are labeled by one spin and the same spin. So the, the dynamics is basically just due to uh, growth or reduction in the number of tetrahedra. Uh, you get a, a, a dynamics which is almost exactly the loop quantum cosmology one. They're just an additional term with a state dependent contribution. In particular for there will be states in which this is zero and you get exactly the LQC type uh, dynamics. So um, this means that in this, under all these various approximations, you can embed the loop quantum cosmology as we know it within uh, the, uh, the uh, one full quantum gravity formulas. Okay. Then before I uh, 
end up discussing what happens to the cosmological singularity or what could happen to the cosmological singularity in this formalism, sort of uh, uh, taking the, the various suggestions that appeared in the, uh, in the course of the talk. I, I just point out one more uh, result, which is that uh, um, we have a bounce in this context. Uh, given that you have bounce, you, certain, you um, immediately have some accelerated phase right after the bounce. The question arises whether this accelerated phase is uh, short-lived or could be long-lived. And uh, so you want to check how the choice of uh, quantum dynamics in the, in, in the underlying uh, um, group field theory model affects the number of e-folds following the, uh, the bounds in this hydrodynamic regime. So you can uh, reduce it to a specific calculation. And you can show that if you don't include at all the uh, group field theory interactions with the same model we had before and the simplest uh, condensate all involving one spin, then you never get a long-lasting uh, acceleration. And this is also consistent with what people have found in, uh, in L2C, although there, um, well, okay, the context is a little bit different, but uh, uh, that is one reason why they are compelled to introduce uh, an inflaton field uh, to have a long-lasting acceleration, uh, um, given that they cannot just produce it by quantum gravity effects. Things change, however, when you introduce, uh, when you include the effects of the group filter interactions. You do it in a phenomenological way. This is not necessarily looking at all the details of the microscopic model. It's more of a phenomenological analysis. You introduce interactions uh, parametrized by, you just have two terms with two possible powers of the uh, condensate wave function, the quantum cosmology wave function, if you want. First of all, you find that the bounds is uh, confirmed you find that there is indeed this accelerated expansion following the bounce, but then you also find that the interaction produce a decelerated phase and a recollapse. So you get something like a cyclic universe. And in a certain regime of interaction, so if you choose uh, the powers here appropriately within a certain range, you can obtain a very long lasting acceleration. Which means that you have something like a quantum gravity driven inflation without having introduced any uh, weird potential for the scalar field or any additional degree of freedom like an inflaton. The question has been asked to me in, in previous talks, uh, why do you care? And, uh, and meaning why do you want to reproduce inflation? You already have a bounce, you have a more general formalism. And my answer is uh, in, indeed, I don't particularly care. But I want to check what are the possible uh, effects on the effective dynamics coming from different choices of the fundamental models. And then I will leave it to other theoretical consistency checks or to phenomenology to tell me which models are more um, compelling. Okay. Uh, oh, and again, before I discuss uh, uh, singularities in, in two minutes, which is okay, just a dis final discussion. I just want to say that uh, we, we know that physics uh, is not in an homogeneous universe, that you have to include the perturbations if you want to really say something about the world, because we are here and galaxies are here and they were there in the form of quantum fluctuations and inhomogeneities uh, earlier on. And so this slide is just to say we are doing it, so you can extend the relational strategy by introducing uh, uh, additional matter fields that you use as uh, rods to give a notion of uh, local regions in a, in a different variant manner. And uh, at least when you look at just volume fluctuations, uh, you seem to, we seem to find naturally an approximate scale invariance when you perturb around homogeneous uh, condensates, or homogeneous geometries, uh, with some small uh, relative amplitude. But this, first of all, is for volume fluctuations, not matter density. You can extend it, uh, but uh, the calculation is more complicated, and I don't have anything strong to claim uh, there. Uh, first, and second, uh, we didn't yet uh, uh, put uh, constraints on, uh, on this spectrum coming from the dynamics. We didn't use the dynamics of the microscopic model here yet. So this is just a preliminary indication of how you would go about uh, extracting a cosmological power spectrum out of the full theory. 
and in a different approximation with the same starting point, this one, then we developed with, with Ed uh, a, um, a separate universe type framework for cosmological perturbations within the same formalism, which has to do basically with the multi condensate states. Okay, and here you can say something a bit more about the dynamics of these uh, perturbations, and you can obtain explicit uh, quantum gravity corrected equations for this. Uh, 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 for matter density perturbations, uh, but we were not able to solve them yet, except showing that they have the right uh, classical limit. Anyway, so we are working on it, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I hope to be able to say more in, in the near future. Okay, now I go and close and say, okay, this is the old formalism. We extracted cosmology some way. We extracted some effective cosmological dynamics. We are able to check what happens to the volume. What happens to the cosmological singularity? The statement uh, was uh, that the classical cosmological singularity is replaced by a big bounce scenario. And with a mechanism very similar to that of quantum cosmology, there's a sort of quantum gravity pressure forbidding the universe from reaching a zero volume. However, so the nice thing is that uh, this is like in LQC, but uh, potentially within the full theory. But more precisely, that was the statement in a mean field restriction within the hydrodynamic approximations in a condensate phase. These are various things that can go wrong and change the statement. Well, suppose that the mean field approximation, you can improve it by standard methods. Suppose that the effective hydrodynamics is not too different and you still have a, a bounce. Okay, then yes, I, you, can, you would say that you have a cosmic bounce like in LQC. However, this is still if the hydrodynamic approximation of the full theory holds, and if the quantum system, the, your quantum space-time system, stays within the condensate phase. So these are the other two things that can go wrong. First of all, the hydrodynamic approximation may break down. What does it mean? It can break down for all sorts of reasons. Fluctuations become big, uh, and in practice we know it means you have to resort to the molecular or atomic description. You cannot talk anymore about the nice uh, continuum geometric observables that are used. So the, the, what replaces the, uh, the cosmological singularity is something more uh, spectacular or fancy or nasty, which is a real disappearance of a, of a continuum space-time. The various observables that you had just do not make sense anymore. They were uh, only available in the hydrodynamic regime and I couldn't find a more realistic picture. Um, but here you're still within the condensate phase of whatever was your pre-geometric system. So you can be in the same phase, but instead of looking just the aerodynamic uh, description, you have to go a little bit in the atomic description, but you are in the same macroscopic phase. So you are beyond space-time in this sense, but you're still within a phase that in some approximation would look like space-time. Well, the quantum system can also leave uh, the condensate phase altogether due to quantum fluctuations and the, the underlying quantum dynamics. So you can reach criticality, for example. This means that you just have an even more radical disappearance of, a co of continuum space-time. Not only you, li you, you leave uh, the description in which you have nice continuum geometries and you go to a more uh, to a microscopic level, but you also leave uh, the phase in which uh, that continuum approximate description was even possible. This type of phase transitions is uh, called uh, sometimes geometrogenesis when you read it the other way around. You form, you go into a geometric phase if you move towards a condensate phase. And this, uh, in the non-PDF version, was uh, uh, the evaporation of a, of a, of a condensate. Anyway, it doesn't really add that, that much to what I said. So you really, are, so not only you have to, re in this case, it's even more necessary that you go to a non-spatiotemporal pre-geometric description of your system. So you really go beyond space and time, but also out of any spatiotemporal phase. And. Uh, and given that I'm in the final discussion part, okay, may, the suggestion is that this could be something else or what really replaces the cosmological singularity, the evaporation of the system that in a certain regime, in a certain approximation, you describe in terms of uh, geometry and fields and so on. 
uh, okay, so these are the three possible resolutions that I could think of, of the classical cosmological singularity in quantum gravity. And uh, I, I'm not going to place my bet uh, for any of the three at this stage. I, I can tell you that I'm uh, psychologically, emotionally inclined to the more radical one. But I have no reason to opt for one or the other at this stage. The nice thing, and that's really the key message, is that uh, we have a formalism which um, is also uh, related to other formalism, so it's not really invented out of the blue, uh, where you can test uh, the regimes of validity, the dynamical steps between the various scenarios, and check what happens. Okay? using re literally the picture of uh, space-time or quantum space as a quantum many-body system and therefore using uh, almost standard quantum field theory techniques and methods from condensed matter. Thank you. Um, so under all these approximation, well, assumptions or that you that you told us, you recover cosmology. Let's say. Suppose that you want to recover continuum GR, but uh, more general. So, so like the most general in principle. So what is the approximation here? That so you okay. First of all, again, I stress the question refers to continuum GR. So it would be the whatever. Doesn't work anymore. Okay, never mind. I had one slide about uh, inhomogeneities, and that's the closest uh, we can get uh, at this stage uh, to uh, generic geometry. As I said, we have under control in this set of approximations close to homogeneous uh, geometries, and we can ask uh, what is their effective dynamics and so on. And in, in the work with uh, Ed, in one specific uh, approximation, we can show the consistency with classical GR equations for uh, small inhomogeneities. So in this sense, yes, as far as you are close to homogeneous geometries. Of course, as I emphasize, at the discrete level, uh, we have several results that tell us that we have a nice uh, red G action and so on. So if that is what you would call GR, then we have it. But it's, uh, the, the difficult part is really this effective continuum dynamics. What was the technical question? Yeah, the technical, no, technical, I mean, it was just, uh, if you can show again, the, or tell me. It's this impossible. <laughs> so you have this, uh, you, in some approximation, you introduce new quantum cosmology plus an extra term. Mm -hmm. So what was, can you, what was, I really didn't get what this term was, is it important? What, what does it do? So you was try the to look at the solution was the question? Uh, ah, you want to ask, you are asking how it influences uh, the, the, the dynamics? Or, yeah. Well, you can see that it goes like one over B. So it just enhances uh, the, the bounds in a, in a literal sense. But I cannot say that it really has any more drastic uh, effects uh, at this stage. I don't know if you, you, you ask this question to yourself or to others. Yeah, I mean, it essentially shifts the energy scale of a bounce back and back. So but the, the other term, the, there, there are two terms. There's a static LPC term that was stronger. So one will win no matter what. Okay. But the other term, the new term, will just shift the energy scale of the bounce back. But it's not changing the numbers. I'm, I'm asking because we are doing something and we also find that some completely different approaches find some modifications to the standard. Well, like, okay. mm -hmm. so, so, and then we get this cosmological contract. Like, so, uh, qualitative. Like, so, the the yeah, yeah, so, the short answer is that uh, qualitatively is the same type of uh, mm -hmm. dynamics, but it changes uh, a little bit the, the quantitative uh, details. It's a phase in which uh, uh, the, if you take typical or generic uh, quantum states, uh, they are not going to look uh, like uh, uh, they can be approximated uh, nicely by s uh, smooth fields, so a metric uh, scalar fields and so on. Okay, but it's because you have quantum geometry. Call it as you like. Okay. Yeah, call it as you like. I mean, you ask me. What I'm calling something, and that's okay. what I'm calling something. Okay. The point is that you know, the moment you start saying uh, quantum geometry, quantum space-time, uh, yeah, you can call whatever you like quantum space-time until you tell me what what it is, and that's what it is. And in fact, actually, sorry, just to 
one more thing. It's even worse. I mean, generic states, as I said at the beginning, they're not even nice quantum uh, piecewise flat uh, discrete simplicial geometries. So it's a bit worse than just not being uh, smooth uh, geometries. I am very much sympathetic to this use of many body uh, logic. That's good. Of, uh, one body density matrices. I want to ask you uh, uh, many body physics, every time the one body density matrix approach works, why is when there are separation of scales, the most separation of scales? Mm -hmm. Do you see a uh, well, there is a nice separation scale in the technical sense that on the group uh, you have a clear notion of UV, IR, and you don't see any obvious mixing in the quantum dynamics. So in this sense, uh, the RG flows we have uh, established for some models, which are usually simpler than the, than the more realistic ones, do not seem to suggest any mixing of scales. So in this sense, the answer would be yes. Uh, but it, it would be even nicer to actually check if uh, the, um, how to say, the, the validity of this uh, description in terms of one body reduced uh, uh, density, in terms of fluctuations and so on, um, is violated, so the validity is violated also in this context due to some mixing of scales. This is not clear because the effective field theory uh, around this type of condensates uh, will, will probably be a bit different than the usual one. So I'm not sure that uh, the initial assumption that if there is a violation is due to violation of, to separation of scales, to violation of the separation of scale, is going to be valid here as well. But I don't know if it is. Uh, non geometric fields, uh, what mm -hmm. should be a manifestation of uh, manifestation of that assumption? One body that's in the system is not working, which is good. I mean, uh, yeah. as we said, it's something that happens. Yeah. So it would be good to have a parameter information. No, no, sure, sure. And the second is that you mentioned uh, these explorations in finding an inflationary phase mm -hmm. and a reasonable number of importance. So that clearly. You need a, se a separation of space between a mass clamp and inflationary scale. But you notice that you're. The text yeah. And I don't know if it's sure, but the point is that uh, you're talking here about two different scales. Yeah. So the scale of inflation, or the notions of scale that you uh, you want to be separated and so on in, uh, in uh, an inflationary picture, are those of the effective field theory. That here, if everything holds, uh, applies only to the hydrodynamic approximation, the geometric phase. The scales that you want to keep uh, separated to have a good notion of a one body reduced uh, density and so on and that uh, will tell you what is the phase diagram are those of the underlying uh, non-geometric system. And the relation between the two uh, will have to be tested uh, in the geometric phase. So I, I don't know what to really expect here. Sorry, in the LQC reduced uh, yeah, in, case? In your regression, your regression depends on one over P. So this is not scaling by. Okay, that's right? the extra. So curve. it's true that this shifting. But this is the relational volume. volume. What? This is the volume as a function of the relational uh, yeah, clock. But still, it's not scaling. It's not e dot over b. It's one over b. If I scale the volume, uh, this is scaling, right? So you are, you are telling me. Uh, yeah, that you can measure it in different the, units. Uh, the density to which this bounce happens. So I can have bounce at under I scale. I'm not sure. I agree with the premise of the question. So do you agree that, that your equation is not scaling by? What do you mean by scaling by? It's scaling the volume. Oh, it is. No, it's not. It is. I, I, see, I, no, see, no, one no, that, no, I see one over P. I see one over P. The numerator has constants of emotion. motion. Which scale when you rescale the, the volume? So those, those cancel. So there are numerators that are constants of emotion. motion. And those rescale when you rescale the volume also. So that cancels. So, but he said that it's not scaling by. 
That equation? Yeah. I think it is. It is scaling by. I think it is. Anyway, we can we can discuss. Yeah, we can discuss. Thank <laughs> you.